interview with Sanjay, ex-monk, ex-Sogyal Rinpoche student, ex-worker for Rigpa organisation, was um, taken a couple of months after the letter by the eight students was given out. I asked him to share some of his experiences working um, in the upper levels of the organisation. When I did the interview, it gave me a sense of the kind of trauma that is created by this um, environment of violence, if you like. We're sharing it now um, so that you can see that this has happened to real people and is likely still happening to very real people. We're very, very lucky that Sanjay has the courage, the considerable courage, to speak up about his experiences. So, here it is. Sanjay, how long were you a student of Soggy Rinpoche? I would say, you could say at, at least 16 years in Rigpa, if not maybe a bit more. Okay. So, um, how long had you been in Rigpa before you went to Larabling to work closely with him? A couple of years. Okay. Not that long. Okay. Because I was already kind of quite committed, as, as I said, because of um, being with other Buddhists. Yeah. Um, so, Larabling's the main retreat centre in France. What was your role there? Um just to be a student and then a monk and my my work rota or working responsibilities were just always as a tr troubleshooter and developer of technical solutions audio visual and IT mixed together duties right. so yeah okay. IT guy tech monk tech yes techno monk <laughs> I wasn't working very closely with him other than being around retreat up until I started working around Mile Lakes or bringing things to him personally into his household. But when I, when I was in Mile Lakes, you know, sometimes for a month, two months, three months, over the last, say, eight to ten years at times of going to Mile Lakes, more and more I, I'd stay next door and not in his house so I could hear and see all the different daily things happening, um, how they impacted people and I would come over. And then more and more I started to, to run Skype kind of teaching events and Skype calls. So, so those were the main things when I would be close around him and actually in the shrine room helping him in a very close working sort of situation. And those were the times when I, I got the, the most. But I mean, there were, when I was in Larabling, I was always you know, involved to the point where I would be pulled into garden meetings if that was like relevant to me and other people needed me. And so I, I, I was allowed to walk through his, his sort of household area quite often or to bring things to his house there so that was quite similar especially in the last four or five years I, I was allowed to bring things at night or daytime lunchtime you know whenever he whenever I could get access to him but I'm entering in and out of his yep. life yeah as in his private life quite yes. often yeah, yeah. okay for a short burst of time right okay so um what sort of behaviours did you experience personally that you would now, looking back on, would consider to be um, either physical or emotional abuse? Well, there were kind of, there were times when I saw him with, in his shrine room with his attendants that I saw him like pulling her hair, you know, hitting her around the face or the body and um, he often would make sure that I had to go away if anything like that was happening. It was just that it would ha sometimes he wouldn't hold back even though I was around. And that gave me the impression that that was kind of happening all the time. Um, because he, because I would hear him uh, expressing, you know, that there's a problem and, and someone had messed up 
you know, very often, even just walking past the garden, I would hear people scream or him telling them to come now. And but yeah, I saw I saw him hitting people, and he and there were times when I was involved and I would get punched. It wasn't just like t getting a back scratcher and hitting people on the head for a mistake, like in a ritual, you know, way where people would just accept it like a blessing. But there were times when he was really upset because something wasn't done that he needed done. Like his, ra there was the time when his radio w wouldn't work and he was hitting Seth with this huge text with ha which had a, like a kind of a wooden backing to it. A thin one, thin wooden backing, like you know, as if it was a blessing, but it was this huge book, Tibetan book. And then I said, "Well, don't hit Seth, because he didn't really fail, and this it was me." And he stopped, and then turned to me and said, "It's all very well to say that, but..." And then he started laying into me with it, and it, I'd been quite scared up until that point that that might happen. Um, and that I might actually react in my own violent way, you know, as a defense mechanism, but I didn't, I just took it. So then everyone's kind of talks afterward and they say, you know, you did very well to take that, you know, beating. So you get this kind of like, well done, you've been beaten, you know, from the other students. I saw him hit students' heads together many, many times. and. Uh, or just sometimes when he was really angry, I saw him just punch people in the stomach and they'd like to the point where they'd fall down or he would, there was one time not that long, only a, couple, a few years ago where he was punching everyone in the stomach running around. And, and then more and more, once I'd seen that kind of thing, I would know what when he was going to do it because you could see his face change into this kind of wrathful face, and then he would he would and if he didn't if he was saying no to anything that he wanted and he would just look very sort of scary and start picking things up and throwing them around or hitting you with things or punching you. But it depend it would depend on who was there, you know. If it was private, that would be more violent. But if it was, there was some other people around, he might try to make it look like he was just trying to get things done. And when you say punch in the stomach, are we talking like a a hard punch? I mean, yeah, how, quite how? hard. Quite hard. Not like uh, actual fighting. Like trying to trying to like trying to um, like put you down as if you're in a fight kind of punch but very quite hard mm. sometimes many you know this wasn't play fighting and there wasn't any sense of play it was just it was like a wrathful kind of punishment and sometimes a lot of pinching you know but like where really grabbing you you know like a big making you say you know ow you know and I mean, it's a time, when it's happening, you just think it, that you've displeased the teacher and you're getting a kind of disciplined or whatever. But it's when it starts getting more and more frequent and and not it doesn't it seems just over very petty things and people are crying afterwards that you that you take it to be that it's gone out of control, you know. So you said that he, you saw, you've seen him hitting his attendants. What, what was he hitting them with? Oh, you know, whatever. I don't know. Um, I saw. I told a story how one time a monk brought him a cup of tea, and he dressed, and he was teaching. And before we, quite a long time ago, before we had the big temple, and we were still teaching in this like what they called the barn venue in Rovling and then the monk gave him and he tasted it and didn't like it and he called that person um, outside and they kind of went around the corner down the stairs outside and and you heard the sound of the 
the mug smashing and then he, the monk came back and he had a cut on his head from the mug, the mug had been smashed over his head. Right. And then he, you know, he was bleeding and he went off and, and then, the, then Sogyo was like very, um, just sending him gifts and trying to like tell him he's good and make up for it and whatever. But, so but the, what, monk very, the monk were very upset. You know, but, right. Yeah. So that was, it was, that was quite a long time ago, you know. Yeah. So the point I'm trying to say is that the small, the relatively small amount of time that I was in his presence, it was very common for me to, to either receive or see that happening to someone else. And so then it's like a, it's a situation of, of the threat of domestic violence is always there. If, if whether you make a mistake or not, if something is a mis is fail, someone fails to deliver just for whatever reason, whether it's their fault or not, if they're the one telling the bad news, then they will get a good chance they will get, you know, not always, sometimes they'll just say to them that it's, you know, it's unacceptable and send them off to work and solve, solve it until they've done made him happy or but other times they would get that kind of the sound of things being thrown and or you know i can say that i've talked to my friends and they've told me much more severe cases you know like being knocked out physically or knocked off their feet you know and um this is the the impression that i got is is also from talking to everyone else about their stories of, of being hit it, and it, that pushed me more and more um, to to be kind of fearful about what was happening. Every period of time that I was around him, there would be some kind of discipline like that. Yeah, it's sudden rage appears, and and that face expression happens, and it, and he could come back to being calm again very quickly too, which he would say is is a sign that he was under control. It doesn't. I, you can call it wrath, but you can also call it anger. I mean, people say it, describe it as being angry mm. half the time. So, what about the emotional abuse? Well, a lot of a lot of telling people that they're they're bad and that they they let him down and they let other people down and and um, they're a waste of time, waste of money, waste of space, and that they should just you know do better or go home and um, emotional abuse for me personally ca came in the form of never anything is good enough okay and if it's not even if it is and he's happy one year the next year it's not good enough then and he wants better and and so you're always under pressure to do better or be a disappointment and that is abusive to me. It puts you under a lot of stress. People who are like told that they really, it's really bad to displease the Lama, like seriously karmic injury kind of. So they're, the feeling of worth and the feeling of spiritual kind of heaviness around it is a lot. For me, I could have kept up with that, except that um, it, it was like there were times when he was just so disgusting, you know, just like like the 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 time when I left, he was he was speaking to all these people on Christmas Eve, you know, and he was saying, you know, very inappropriate things, you know, and like, how is she? Did you fuck her? And you know. And this is in public, you know, and then, and I'm sitting next to the, you know, him in this shrine room while he's doing that and, and just going off and, and you're all, how terrible everything is. And, you know, you're, it just, it just put me in tears, you know, that, that's what I mean. Like, you know, just seeing things that you find so horrible that you're in tears and you're disgusted, not, not challenging your love and devotion to the point of, of breakdown, you know, mm. Mm. or just you know, you work 
really hard for a long time and you give an offering and it's just you're just told that you failed and it's bad and you have to fix it you know by a ridiculously impossible time or you know and it's just something like that doesn't even really it's just like a a video for his son's birthday that you're helping him make you know that kind of thing makes you makes you just someone like me shaking you know with shaking with stress that you can't you can't get it done you have to work out all night to get it done and if it's not done you've displeased him and I don't know because you're trying you know really hard for, to to do what you think spiritually is is a good offering you know hmm. What I'm really talking about is the problem is like the things that I find hard to talk about, you know, like the fact that he's having a relationship with a woman and in his entourage and you, you're just realizing that they're, they've been fighting and they're having kind of, you, a Skype call is not about Buddhism or anything, it's about that they're having a relationship and you can see that person's very hurt on the other end and, and then there's having a relationship with another woman and another and all at the same time that, and then along with that you're just told oh your, your work is terrible this is terrible get out you disappointed me and then you st that's like the psychological impact is that you're what, if, what am I even here what's going on what is this all about and mm -hmm. It's making less and less sense all the time. Yeah. I've got, I've seen him have people strip down and dance around, but I haven't I haven't seen him have like do anything sexual with anyone. So mm. so I'm I'm basically standing by the fact that I've talked to numerous women who have and <clears throat> and that I. I can't disregard what they're saying because I know them and the stories fit with the way he lived, you know. <clears throat> the fact that there were houses where he had people stay, where they, there was, you know, it was set up privately <clears throat> for that kind of arra bedroom arrangement, you know. It was like, a, this is their bedroom for Rinpoche and this person. In that room, in that house, and like that was just known that he was having sex with some people, and and so the question is, is that even an appropriate thing? You know, maybe with one partner, and it's a lo if it's a loving, but if it's with many partners and or all the people in the entourage, and then people people started telling me that it's like that that I, I just started to wonder about it and, and, and can they even say no, you know? And then, then you hear the stories like on the internet where there are people getting asked again and again and again until they, until they submit um, and things that are written like that behind the tongue of this thing. Mm. And that just became like, okay, like, that's how I know him to be when he wants something and you can't say no and it's not he doesn't really ask you like if you want to or not it's just like I want I want to so you will you know and that's and he's in a super powerful position so then I just say well I I can't say they're abusive but there are I can say that I believe there's a lot of relationships that are sexual between him and and women because of their testimony and that I find it to be abusive of his power. Whether they find it to be abusive like themselves is for them to say, you know. And and I believe that they have said that and that and and ever since I left and opened up on the topic uh, if is this an abusive power, which is a random thing I was saying. And are these, you know, allegations of sexual abuse you know, to be disregarded or to be, you know, taken seriously. Um, more and more people who ha had been involved 
with Rigpa and around his household, and that had the same story that we heard in in just talk to me privately about it. So I mean, even just today, another one that I that I don't even know, but the, so you know, it's just many, <laughs> many people, and I just think that it's enough. For me to step out and and then if if people don't talk about it, like then no one has no one who has the problem has anyone to talk to. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And then that's why I'm what I I've become someone that some people have decided to talk to. So. Yeah. Yes. I, I I haven't taken it to the press or anything. You know, yeah. I haven't done anything like. That. What was it that finally made you? decide, no, I, I can't stay here any longer. My health and the lack of interest in my health, which is what I would classify as neglect. The fact that I was being really worked hard because the, just the schedule is so hard and there were less and less people to do my work because it's very specific. So you do the kind of superhero get through this intensive retreat. But it's not just one retreat a year, you know, if you're on tour yeah. and you could, it's like seven days here, two days here, on the road in cold weather here, and then back in Australia in tropical weather, can't sleep, working at night, working at the retreat, um, coming back at night, working until midnight, then having getting waken up very early in the morning, because of Rimche needing something and wanting to talk to you and then and then having to get something done by a certain amount of time, then having to rush to the retreat and do it and just as a constant, constant for like ten, fifteen days. And feeling just very ill and telling people I'm ill and I need to stop but but you you feel like if you stop you create a huge like gap that will shut the retreat down so or if, even if you want to leave, the responsible thing is that they need some other IT person to, to do all the tasks that, mm. you know, mm. he needs daily, which are mostly indulgences. And so basically I felt very, very neglected and sick. And um, you, know, you do have down periods where you can recover and look after yourself. But I just found it to be an unhealthy lifestyle. And uh, because, you you know... You also have to do your daily practice. You have commitments. You have to do sadhanas, mm. the hours, and mm. dharma parlors that take you know at least half an hour to to an hour. Mm. And um, you have and you med you want to meditate. If you're trying to keep your meditation practice, you, you, it either breaks and you drop it, or or you do it you know skillfully. Mm. Mm. All those things together you sort of burning the candle at both ends and then when you're getting to be 48 and obese it's not and then you get told off for being obese and 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 tired like it's your fault um, so that's psychologically abusing that's fat shame um, fat shaming you know that kind of thing he's very good at ignoring all the like politically correct. I mean, I don't really think that much of political correctness, but some things are shown to be psychologically harmful, you know, and that's why they're politically incorrect or just not done. Mm. So, you know, and then you see, you, you're told you're, you're so small if you complain about anything like that, so. But that's just another thing on the pile of many mm. things that are making you tired when... Mm. You need the you know you should get up and exercise as well and all this thing. <laughs> just another thing to do just another thing to do or yeah. so that you're not you're not fat and disturbing him in your fatness that's just the kind of thing that adds up and yeah. makes it yeah. less and less of a spiritual environment where people respect each other um, I think one thing that people who have never been in an abuse situation find it really can't get their heads around is why people stay in those situations for so long so can you shed any light on why you remained in yeah. that situation for such a long time the sunken cost 
of my life invested in it to and the commitment that I made to myself and others of staying uh, um, with him as my teacher and supporting the vision of Rigpa and the vision of bringing Dharma to the West, that if this teacher says that they're going to do, to do it and then you, you take uh, bodhisattva vows and things that say, well, even if I have to do it all by myself, I will. So I took that quite seriously, you know, like mm -hmm. there were times when the three-year retreat, when it was announced that there would be a home retreat and I knew they didn't had any plan at all and only I really came up with the plan for it and then there was a lot of things that weren't covered that I had to just fill in the gaps and do that kept me up often for only four hours sleep a night for really long periods of time. So I felt like a sense of accomplishment and people were very happy and that was a, so that was a kind of situation where even though you could see it negatively, you could also see it positively and that it is hard work getting big things done and but that benefited a lot of people. So then I continued to to try and just take difficulties in my stride. And then I found woke up one day in an abusive relationship and um so I am I wasn't sure when it became that kind of relationship. But it had become that, and it was time to say that I'm not going to be part of that and leave. So I did say that in the retreat. I said I want not. I don't want to go back to where I I don't know if you remember. And then, in then he told me to go back, and I found myself just saying yes, even though I didn't want to, and saying kind of sunken cost or habit habit of just saying yes. Not no, because saying no to to Rimche is, is will get you in trouble. I, I wanted to ask you about the culture um, at that sort of level where the where people are working very intensely um, for this to go on. There must be some sort of culture there that um, maintains it from yeah, the, the, the students. The, Can you say anything? There's about a that? there's a training culture of attendance training new attendants and then there's a saying you know very clearly you have to do everything is asked of you you might not get enough sleep and you know but it's not it's you know there can be good times you have time off and you can just do what you like but you'll try and keep everyone busy and that's just how we are here it's for your accelerated spiritual development so it sounds like bad and good it sounds like oh, well, I want accelerated spiritual development and I want I want to be included in the Zogchen teachings and uh, I want to know this teacher and so okay I'll, that doesn't some of the things don't sound good but okay and then everyone's like every day they very feel very pleased if they deliver you know. And if they don't deliver, they, they get called in and there's a big group thing with, often with Rinpoche saying, you know, you failed me, you this, you like, have to do better, why are you even here, and that kind of shaming thing. So then, you know, there's just a negative reinforcement, positive reinforcement, and checking People are checking up on you to make sure you're, what is he doing? Is he wasting his time or is he doing what, you know, something useful? Um, you know, kind of like if you, as if you were working for, for money situation and you are going to get the sack. Um, so, yeah, yeah, so that's what it's like. You have a job, you have duties and they just get told you're costing a lot of money make sure you, this Dharma money, you know, it's like sw swallowing molten iron, so make sure you work hard to be worth it. So then you strive to be worth it and strive not to make sure that, so that is, that's not 
I don't think that's psychologically intelligent, you know. Thing, so. I think that makes people scared all the time. If they're not, they don't have a feeling of self-worth other than what they've done. The summary is that since I spoke out, mostly positive reception, and only a few people were brave enough to kind of shame me publicly or denigrate me what I said. So I think I'm in a good good position. And then because all these people who had bad experiences are talking to me, they actually are very grateful that I'm helping out doing talking, writing things that, that, that make them feel like there is something that they can say and that they don't have to be scared and hide, hide it. It seems like it's a good thing because even though I was only suspicious at the beginning, I mean, it's far, I'm, I'm very convinced, I'm not just it's not just hearsay, it's just the number of people is expanding and there's a systemic problem that it seems to be that he's always finding new people and bringing them in and then a lot of them leave so I mean another reason why I left is because so many people left and then the way they were treated and talked about for leaving was very disgraceful if you ask me and even dishonest things were said about them, as if they were always negative and they had a selfish motivation. Is this Not from, always, the, from the teacher or the student or both? From the teacher. Right. From the teacher side. Okay. So that pushed me out, you know, that and the, and the fact that I saw the, phys, the vi physical violence and then, and then the, the sexual abuse allegations were mounting and, and now, now they seem very like there's, there's definitely a case to be investigated, if not, you know, brought up. Whatever it is those people, you know, need to, to get past this. I'd Sorry. like to, I'd like to help, you know, at least finish saying what I know so that it, it encourages other people to say and then the, the extent is shown rather than it just being diminished into a tiny thing that we can just throw away and ignore. Mm. Mm. All right. No no doubt it has helped a lot of people, but it's well, definitely yes. not not true to say that it's only helping because there's a yeah. lot of people leaving that are, are far from helped but hurt, you know. So this was very tough but I got through it. Thank you no, for you, you did being well. supportive of me and even listening to all.